As many of our listeners already know, our mission at Entercom is all about assisting companies with food safety compliance by simplifying the processes and supporting food companies in the entire process from start to finish. This podcast is a follow-on from our previous podcast where we discuss the mistakes some food business owners make with the facility layout and flow within their food manufacturing facilities. We continue our discussion with Angela Jordan, Intercom East London franchise owner, as we discuss the important step of obtaining your certificate of acceptability for your food premises and what this involves. We have compiled 10 of the most frequently asked questions in this regard for Angela. So welcome, Angela, and thank you for joining us on the second podcast. So first question for you is, what is meant by a certificate of acceptability and why is this necessary? Thank you, Janice. I'm very pleased to be back. Um, A certificate of acceptability is a certificate obtained from your local municipal health department that proves that you comply with all that is said in the Regulation 638 that we chatted about in our first podcast. This regulation holds the legal requirements for all businesses that are handling and selling food to the public. The certificate must be displayed at your facility. Um, You are operating illegally if you do not have the certificate in place, so please ensure that you do. So another question we get asked is, what about these businesses that bake cookies and or cakes for the home industry? Do they also need a certificate of acceptability? Yes, they will need a certificate of acceptability. If you are selling product to a store that goes and sells that product to the general public, you definitely need a certificate in place. The only time a home making food for consumption to the general public would not need a certificate is if you are making food for a charity, a church, educational, or amateur sports organization, or a registered welfare or fundraising organization. So yes, granny baking cakes at home definitely does need a certificate of acceptability. I wonder how many grannies know that. Sure. So what about the person selling pancakes from a food caravan? Would they also need a COA for their food caravan? Yes, they would need a COA um, because they are selling to the public from their caravan. Your food caravan is considered your business premises. Besides the home environment um, manufacturing that I mentioned, the only other premises that do not need a certificate of acceptability are premises that are used for the killing, bleeding or evisceration of animals after hunting, Um, fish, mollusks, mollusks or crustaceans after catching or harvesting, and also facilities that pack, store, display, sell and transport unprocessed agricultural crops. But if those unprocessed agricultural um, crops are sent to the municipal market for sale, then they do need, you you do need a certificate of acceptability. Also reading in the R638 um, about delivery vehicles. So tell us about COAs for delivery vehicles and whether we also need one for something like a scooter if, um, if we're delivering takeaways. Yes, Um, if your vehicle is transporting perishable product for your business, you do need to have a certificate of acceptability in place for that scooter. The the regulation 638 does give a definition on what a vehicle is, um, and it defines a vehicle as a train, trolley, wagon, cart, bicycle, sled, truck, boat, ship or aircraft. So quite a lot there. So yes, definitely your scooter does need a certificate. So with Christmas around the corner, I wonder if Santa knows that if he's delivering any perishable food products that he will need a COA for his one horse open sleigh. (laughs) (laughs) About the whole process of obtaining the COA, where does one go and who do you contact and how long does this whole process take? You will need to contact your municipal um, environmental health department to request a certificate of acceptability for your premises. And you must um, apply in writing to, 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 to get a certificate. Once you inform the municipality that you're needing a certificate, they will send out an, the area environmental health practitioner to come and inspect your premises, making sure that you comply with all the requirements of the regulation. If you comply, your business will then be issued a certificate. On your certificate, you will see the address of your premises, the name of the person in charge, which has to be a natural person and not the name of a business. This person in charge should be working at the premises and overseeing the activities as he or she is the accountable person. The certificate must be displayed in the business. Um, Once your certificate is issued, the EHP or environmental health practitioner will do periodic inspections at the facility 
to ensure that you continue to comply with the regulations. If it is found that you do not comply, then a prohibition could be issued, giving you a time frame to rectify the issue. Should your facility undergo any structural changes, move address or have a change of the person in charge, the municipality needs to be contacted again so that they can reissue the certificate after an inspection. Regarding how long it takes, um, this will differ from municipality to municipality, so I would suggest that you do regular follow-ups um, after you have sent your request through to the municipality. So this regulation 638 covers everything in, in quite a lot of detail and it's important that the business owners get uh, a copy of this. Where do they get hold of a copy of this regulation 638? The regulation is easily accessible. Um, you can have a look on the internet and it is free of charge. Go to the website www.gov.za. Um, we also include this regulation in the 638 starter pack that, that you're going to be chatting about at the end of this podcast. Now, municipal bylaws are, are something that many food business owners aren't aware of. Um, how do they find out more about these bylaws that might apply to them? Um, aside from the, the certificate of acceptability, make sure you ask your local municipality to provide you with all the bylaws that you need to be aware of, um, as these bylaws differ from local municipality to local municipality. SME South Africa also provides a very handy guide on their website called the Ultimate Legal Guide to Opening a Restaurant in South Africa, which can also be of help for you. So have a look for this. Yes, this is a really handy summary, a nice guideline document. So I really encourage everyone to go and have a look at that. Then preparation for the health practitioner's inspection and just making sure that this goes smoothly. How do I prepare? Um, is there anything that I can read, any food safety course that I can attend to actually help me prepare for the COA inspection? Um, yes, read through the regulation 638 um, to understand exactly what is expected of you in your business. Um, the regulation does state that the person in charge, who is the person whose name who actually appears on the certificate of acceptability, needs to undergo training. The regulation says that the person must be suitably qualified or adequately trained in the principles and uh, practices of food safety and hygiene. Um, the regulation also states that this must be accredited training or training conducted by an inspector. Um, when the regulation talks about accredited training, from what we understand from the Department of Health, it is referring to training that is accredited by a CETA. The regulation also refers to training of your staff, stating that they need to be suitably trained in food safety and hygiene. This training does not need to be accredited, and the regulation states that the training can be done by an inspector or a suitably qualified person. By a suitably qualified person, it means that the person must have undergone some form of food safety training themselves. Um, it is also a requirement of the regulation that routine assessments be conducted on the staff after any training to ensure that they have understood the training. If the impact of the training has not been effective, then follow-up training must be organized. And of course, training of these assessments must be kept in files. Okay, so now the, the food business owner wants to go into production and start producing products but now they need to know how do they go about labeling their products and making sure that the the information on the label is correct where's the best place to go for this type of advice there is a labeling regulation that is available called regulation 146 um, it is quite a thick regulation and can be quite complicated and get a bit tricky so it might be worth you um, contacting a company that can give you expert advice about your labeling, such as FACTS. FACTS specialize in food labeling and nutrition. Um, so it definitely will be money well spent upfront. So give them a call. In the regulation 638, there's quite a, a few references to records and documents, especially when it comes to traceability. Can you maybe give us a summary of all the documents and, and records that we need to start implementing in a, a food production facility as part of the COA requirements? Um, yes, of course. Um, in order for your certificate of acceptability to be issued, the, the regulation definitely does say that you need to have some documents in place, procedures and records. Um, these records and procedures must be maintained and be available to the environmental health practitioner when he or she visits your premises. Um, to summarize these documents, um, 
include documents that are needed for the processing, production and distribution of your product that you're manufacturing. These records must be kept for a period of at least six months after the shelf life of the product. Um, this could include records such as temperature logs, cooking times, weight checks or dispatch records. A second set of documents that are needed is a traceability system. This must be in place so that if needed, you are able to trace your product backwards by knowing exactly what ingredients went into your product and forwards so that you can know exactly where your product was delivered to. So in addition to the documents that I've just mentioned, it's also advisable to have things like incoming goods inspection sheets where you can start recording the traceability of your ingredients coming in and perhaps a production sheet so that you can record down the weight and batch numbers of ingredients going into your product. Third set of records that you need or documents that you need is a recall procedure. This must be in place. So should you ever have to recall your product, you know exactly what steps to follow. You don't want to land up in a panic situation and not know what to do. This procedure should lay out step by step what you and your team need to do. So things such so items such as how do you alert your customers? How do you retrieve your product? Investigate the incident. How do you dispose of the product that's brought back in? And how do you resolve any issues that are identified? It is a good idea to have a key, a list of key contacts within your facility that need to be notified should you ever have to have a, a, a recall. And this key list should obviously be accessible to all. It is a good idea to conduct periodic mock recalls to ensure that your system actually works before an emergency situation takes place. A mock recall is purely a desktop exercise and no product is actually recalled and no stores are actually alerted. Um, ideally, these mock recalls should be done once a year. The fourth set of documents that you need are training programs and records. These must be kept and routinely updated. This could include items such as an annual training plan for scheduled training for the next year, attendance registers and training material. As mentioned, these records must be kept. All these documents that I've been speaking about must be kept and made available to your environmental health practitioner when they visit your facility. Listening to you now with, with all of this, I'm sure that many food business owners are feeling quite overwhelmed and uh, they're going to need advice regarding their certificate of acceptability. So Angela, maybe you can just tell the listeners where can they go to get this type of advice from, to get them started. Um, we'd be happy to help you at Intercoms. You can, you can contact us um, um, via our website at www.intercom.co.za or you can send an email to info at intercom.co.za with your questions. We'd be happy to get in touch with you and answer any questions that you may have. And I'm sure the local EHPs will also be more than willing to assist with any questions. I've found them to be very helpful. So another... Yeah. Another very important item um, that we're quite excited about is that Intercom has put together a free Regulation 638 starter pack for small food businesses. And this consists of a selection of our eBooks that will guide you through the compliance process, some of the regulations such as the 638, as well as the Regulation 146, which is the labeling regulation and some guidelines as, as well there. And then in addition to this, um, we've also put together some key procedure templates and checklists to, to help you get started. So I really hope that that will be of value. So send us a mail to info at intercom.co.za and uh, we'll send that free 638 starter pack to you. Thanks, Angela, uh, for once again taking the time to answer the, the questions that we always have for you. And these were just typical questions that we hear regarding the certificate of acceptability. Um, so you haven't escaped us yet. You're going to be back and we're really grateful for that. And we're going to be discussing in our next podcast, high risk foods and why these require special food hygiene requirements. Thank you, Janice. I look forward to chatting again.